Hi, everybody. Are you all in a food coma at this point? Post-lunch food, food baby? All right. Hi, welcome. If you're joining us for the innovative teaching practice session, please take your seats. We love teaching teachers. <laughs> Such an easy audience. All right. The last session, there, it was much larger, full, but larger doesn't mean better necessarily. So my name is Paula Haug, and this is Dr. Angela Prelip. We teach in the Communication and Media Studies Department at Folsom Lake College, and uh, we're humbled to be presenting for you today, and we hope we will provide for you something that's useful. Uh, we teach 100% online public speaking at Folsom Lake College. And the question we get asked most often is, how? How do you do that? How does that even happen? Um, and we always like to joke that we do it well. We're, we're doing it pretty well. Uh, and the second question that we get is, why? Why are you doing this? Or should you be doing this? And so if we have time, we will get into some of that as well. But predominantly, we want to show you the tool that's used and how you can use it in your classes. How many of you teach hybrid or online classes by a show of hands? How many of you do group work in your face-to-face -face classes? All right. This is something, how many of you have office hours? All right. So this is something that could help you uh, in your teaching. Um, so a little bit of background, um, I've been teaching public speaking for a long time. I've been at it for 28 years, and you're at 15, I think, so quite a while. And we've been doing some innovative things out at Folsom Lake College. We started doing hybrid oral communication classes about 10 years ago. Uh, we've done a lot with recording. With We started with Sony bloggy cameras, and we've graduated to iPads and whatnot. We have a comm lab at Folsom Lake, which is the coolest thing you've ever seen. It looks like a British phone booth on the outside. There's a fireplace. I'm not kidding. There's a fireplace inside. looks like Winston Churchill's war room. Uh, it's the coolest thing on campus in our opinion. So we've done some innovative things, but there were some things we could not do. If you've ever read an oral comm course outline of record, which I highly recommend because it's just a good time, um, it includes language that says stuff like uh, students must experience a minimum of 22 minutes of uh, evaluated speaking time in the presence of an instructor in front of a live, appropriately sized audience. All right, so it's very, very prescriptive about how we do what we do. And we wanted to experiment with some different things, but we couldn't because we were bound by our course outline of record. So a couple of years ago, the CSU GE online, or I'm sorry, they started an oral communication pilot, the CSU GE committee did, and we hopped into that. We are one of five California community colleges to participate in that along with some of our CSU system partners as well. And we hopped in mid-semester, so we couldn't remodalitize our classes, but we immediately started incorporating activities and assessments that were completely online for our public speaking. From a research standpoint, we geeked out so hard because we were able to compare regular face-to-face, -face, hybrid, and now fully online public speaking classes and compare how well students achieved SLOs, uh, get survey data from our students, what they thought, uh, how they felt about the experiences, so on and so forth. We also, in addition to wanting to experiment a little bit, we wanted to participate in the pilot because we were actually a bit skeptical. Uh, because I've been teaching public speaking since, well, a long time, <laughs> for a good long time, uh, there was a part of me that just thought, this isn't real. This isn't real unless there's human pheromones involved, all right? Unless there is a face-to-face -face element to this thing, it, it just doesn't count. Um, so we were very skeptical about, is this something we can do? And even if we can do it, should we do it? And another part of it was that um, we, uh, what was the other part of it? Just, just you know, we wanted to see if it, we were we skeptical. Well, and also, um, yeah, we wanted to break it. We wanted to, to see how, if it was really all that, and so on and so forth. Oh, oh, the other reason was that we feared that the only people that would be participating in the pilot would be like gung-ho tech boogies that were like all totally, woo, let's do this. And so we wanted to make sure that there was some balance. So we hopped into the pilot. And uh, for four semesters now, we've been teaching 100% online uh, public speaking. And we tested out, we test drove about five or six different technology tools in order to determine which ones were easiest to use. Figured I was a good beta test because I'm really not that tech savvy and if I could figure it out, 
anybody could. So we looked at Google Hangouts, we looked at Zoom, we looked at GoToMeeting, Skype for Business, CCC Confer, and another one that frustrated me so deeply that I actually burned the neural pathway in my brain and I cannot remember the name of it because I wanted to harm it. Um, so we played with different technology tools. I like Zoom, so that's what I use in my courses. I teach the hybrid classes and I do online things in the hybrid classes. I'm too chicken to go completely online. Actually, I became academic senate president and I don't have the, enough time to do it. But uh, Angela is doing 100% online public speaking, so I'm going to let her talk about what she does and how it works. Thanks. All right, thanks, Paula. So as an instructor of communications, it goes against my grain to think that you could actually do a 100% online public speaking course. So kind of going back to what Paula was saying, when I got received the email saying there's this pilot program going on, I got a little bit terrified inside. I am a tech guru. I was the instructional development coordinator here at American River College before I moved over to Folsom Lake College. And so my job has been to train faculty in how to use different types of tech tools to integrate into their courses for student engagement and just really to be able to up the level of content. So when I saw this email come through, it must have been five seconds before I marched over to Paula's office saying, no, this cannot happen. Uh, we have to preserve our discipline. We need to make sure this doesn't go any further. So I offered to go ahead and do it because I figured I'm the one that has the background to be able to go through and see how this would not happen and could not happen. And I wanted to make sure that if someone could break it, it would be me. Uh, that's generally what I do with technology is I work my hardest to break it so that way I can try to fix it. And within uh, about a month or so into the class, I realized I might actually be dead wrong. I might really be on to something that I did not want to be on to. And the success rate of my students was off the charts. Uh, they were engaged, they were connecting. They, before we did a Google Hangout, they were talking with each other online. There was a sense of community and a sense of relationships that was taking place in this online public speaking course that I really didn't anticipate, uh, simply because it was so new. And again, it goes against how do you do a speech online? So to kind of give you an idea of what that looks like, I had some students volunteer to let me have access to their video, their Google Hangouts. I'm just gonna show you just a little bit of it. To be named Fort Gibson after the US Army officer who died during the war. As immigrants from Europe began to flood the US borders, the federal government had to get involved. In 1890. All right, so as a communications instructor, a lot of folks would think that teaching online public speaking class would be a lot easier than teaching it on ground. Well, the reality is when we opened this class up for enrollment, I thought for sure no one would show up to the party. I put together hours and hours and hours worth of curriculum, I developed this class, and it really did feel like that moment of, is anybody gonna come? Is anybody going to be willing to even sign up for this class? And to my dismay, <laughs> or pleasant surprise, or somewhere in between, I get an email from Paula saying, your class is full. It's 11 o'clock on day one of registration. Your class is full and closed with a full wait list. And so then I had this absolute panic-stricken moment of, oh no, they signed up for my class because they didn't realize they have to do speeches. So I'm gonna have at least 25, 30 people signed up for my class who don't understand what they got themselves into. So after s communicating and letting them know that they're going to give speeches online and you're going to have to meet at particular times to deliver your speech, be prepared for it, I was surprised at how many students were willing to go ahead and go through the class and did so successfully. Out of 30 people, uh, 28 successfully finished my class the first semester. And so for an online class, retention success rate was off the charts, which is not normally the case. So how did we get to this point? Well, I really do feel like online tools such as Google Hangout or Zoom, I think they both work, they work very similar if not the same, really do key, uh, create a sense of community. And so a lot of you in the audience wonder, well, I don't teach communications and I am surely not gonna take 100% online public speaking class. I barely get through my own classes, let alone actually talking in front of colleagues or other people. 
Uh, I like to challenge all of you to really think about ways that you can integrate this particular tool into your classes. So how many of you offer online office hours? Okay, so online office hours in itself could be a great opportunity to house a Google Hangout because they get to see you and you get to share your screen, you get to interact with your, your students in a way that a phone call or an email just doesn't do. Um, I often hold Google Hangout sessions with my online classes just simply to create a sense of community and connection and sometimes they just like to hear what I have to say about an assignment rather than reading a long email, which we know our students have attention span the size of a goldfish um, <laughs> on good days. And so by being able to check in with me and seeing me and being able to walk through it, they feel just a little bit more encouraged and feel like they can do it uh, with that encouragement. Also in my classes, I tend to use Google Hangouts to actually record my screen and either I'll have a Google um, Hangout Live where students can just check in as I'm going through the assignments that particular week or I'm just recording myself so I can then post it later on for them to watch. And again, the, the student response has actually been really positive because again, they're hearing me say, they're getting my verbal instructions that they would not normally get in an online class. So Google Hangouts or Zoom, it's fairly easy to use once you get past that initial, I hate hearing myself talk and I surely don't wanna see myself. Uh, it becomes very user friendly. And I have to say that with the online public speaking class, some would say or argue within our own discipline that an online public speaking class doesn't necessarily feel the same as a face-to-face -face class. And I, you know, the argument could be made, does my class feel the same as Paula's face-to-face -face class? You know, we all teach differently. That's the beauty of where we work and the, um, the academic freedom that we have. But there's something also to be said about try being this student, watching themselves deliver their speech in front of a, little, a bunch of boxes of students peering at them the entire time. Because the reality in my face-to-face -face class, as much as I would love to pay attention to everyone in my class, it's impossible. I am eyes on the audience, on the speaker. My class is master texters. I would like to say that they are diligently paying attention and they're focused in, but they're texting with their toes if they got away with it, right? They, that's just what they do. In my online classes, you can see when students aren't paying attention. You can see when they're off over here in YouTube land or on Snapchat or whatever they might be doing. And I can send them a quick little chat message saying, hey, if you want that student participation grade, I can see you. Uh, you need to make sure you're paying attention to us and take good notes to make sure you're turning in later. So the actual participation in my online classes using Google Hangouts is at a much higher rate than it is in my face-to-face -face classes. And the feedback that our students get, and Paula mentioned in our last workshop, you know, in our face-to-face -face classes when students give each other feedback, it's always something along the lines of, good job, great eye contact. Right, because they're thinking, I'm next, I'm next, be nice to me. And in an online class, there's a running chat going. So you can see the feedback as you're actually delivering your speech, which has to be said, you know, the level of anxiety also increased because you have your classmates saying, look at us, look at us. Oh, good job, good job. Oh, don't forget, look at us. Because they want to see them be successful, but they can actually see that feedback live rather than in a face-to-face -face class, you get back a piece of paper with a couple comments on it, which is normally literally good job, thumbs up. I, I barely paid attention to you, but I'm doing this because I have to and here you go. So I offer, you know, or I challenge you to take the opportunity to give it a try. Yeah, you're not gonna break Google. Google, if you break Google, <laughs> Man, I applaud you. I've been trying to break Google for years. Uh, but give it a try to see how you can integrate this face-to-face -face contact with your students, even if you're teaching chemistry or math or sciences or English, and really make that personal connection in a way that they can go back and either watch the video because it records it, or that they can actually feel like they have a personal connection with you, even in a scary, isolated online world. Do you have anything else to add? Oh, just that if you uh, do want to participate in this, you can go to the apps feature on your phone and search, and you can search for Zoom, you can search for GoToMeeting, they're very similar, uh, download those for free. We do have a relationship with Zoom, Canvas and Zoom are somehow connected. Uh, you can get a professional account uh, through the district if you wish to really blow it up. 
in my public speaking classes, as many as 30 students can be participating in the session on Zoom at once. So it's pretty cool and it's absolutely free. And again, very, very easy to use. You can even embed the links to your meetings right in Canvas. It's uh, Zoom is one of the external tools that Canvas hosts. So very, very easy to incorporate into your classes if you ever decide to do that. And if you have any questions, we hope you'll email us Prelip, Haug, we're at Folsom Lake College and we would love to walk you through anything or help you out with it or have a Zoom session with you and explain it uh, in person. So thank you very, very much. I'm Donisha Lugo, I'm a sociology professor at Consumnes River College, and I am going to give you some different strategies for innovative teaching practices. I want to preface this um, presentation to say I was really inspired to um, develop these strategies from Dr. Chris Emden, if you've heard of him. Um, he was a speaker at Sac City College, but he was our convocation speaker at CRC last semester very inspirational. He started a movement called Hip Hop Ed, which is about 10 years, I think it turned 10 years old this year. Um, and that is about incorporating um, hip hop lyrics, hip hop um, concepts into your teaching method. So the first strategy that I wanna give you is to show your vulnerability, and that is share your story. And when I say share your story, I'm not talking about the normal way you share your story. You tell your students where you went to college at, um, where, what you studied, why you chose your career. I'm talking about tell them your personal story so they get to know you as a person. So I initially used to tell my students, yeah, I went to Sac City, I transferred to UC Davis, um, I got my BA in sociology, then I went to Sac State and got my master's in soc. Then I'd tell them about my work history, and that's great, but they didn't really get to know me as a person. This semester, I opened up with starting from my family, so letting them know about who I was and where I came from. And then I proceeded to kind of go along a timeline and let them know how I was as a student. So I let them know my experiences in high school, which was I graduated high school with a 2.0. I let them know my experiences at Sac City, which was I had the bare minimum to transfer to Davis at the time, which was 2.8. But at the end, by the time I graduated at Sac State with my master's, I had a 3.5. And what that did for my students was for them to be like, that sounds like my road. And look, you're a professor now, so there's a chance that I can actually do something like that. I decided to do this mainly based off of Dr. Emden, but I realized one semester when I asked my students what they thought of me, their perception was totally different than who I was. They thought I came from this totally different background than what I did, and I noticed when I was able to share my personal story, they uh, made more of a connection to that. The next strategy that I'm gonna give you is re reinforcing a safe environment. And that is making sure that you're going over class norms and values, repeating those class norms and values throughout the semester, and making sure that students understand that you respect and you appreciate their contributions to discussions in class. So I run my classes a little bit differently. I don't lecture for an hour and 20 minutes. My style is really conversational. We have dialogues in our class. Um, and I make sure that even if we get off tangent that I am reaffirming my students and their contribution, but I'm also redirecting them. So reaffirmation and redirection is also very important because any contributions you want a student to feel like they are safe giving their voice. <clears throat> Another concept that I remind them throughout the semester, it's a very important concept, I remind them at the beginning, throughout every class, every semester, is that understanding somebody and their choices doesn't mean you agree with them. So understanding why someone wants to marry a certain person, choose a certain career field, that doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but you being able to understand and show them some empathy is the first step to kind of bridging a gap. 
Um, this was very important, especially probably last year when I was teaching during the election, um, mainly because most of my classes were anti-Trump. However, I had a couple students that were Trump supporters. I was very um, glad that they felt comfortable to share their views of that they supported Trump and why they supported Trump without feeling that their classmates were gonna attack them. So I think it's very important to make sure that you create that safe environment in the classroom. The next strategy I'm going to give you is making connections. So I know I teach sociology. I can connect anything to sociology. I, it's kind of cool like that. So we can talk about Jordans and talk about a social learning theory or social class or functionalism. Um, however, I think that every discipline can incorporate some type of technology, some type of current event to their subject in order to kind of reel their students in more. I use a lot of um, technology. We look at YouTube videos. We watch What Would You Do episodes. Um, music is a big part of my class. Every class, at the beginning of every class, I have at least one song I play. My songs usually coincide with whatever my lecture topic is. So for example, at the end of the semester for my social problems class, we were covering social action and social change. So I played um, a couple songs. I think one was like by Bob Marley, something about fighting for power. So making sure that my songs and the music that I give them actually connects to the topics that I'm discussing. What this has done, it's kind of created this really um, community type classroom to where now I have students that send me songs, they send me video clips, they send me news articles, and then I share those with the class. What I was introduced to this semester, which I've never been introduced to before, was something called Turban Trap. If you've never heard of Turban Trap, it's music. Um, and it's, it's pretty good. I would Google it. One of my students referred it to me. Um, I would also suggest that you look at different ways that you can incorporate different ideas in your classroom. Um, Dr. Emmon talked about using the first two weeks of your class to let, make sure that students get to know who you are as a person so that you can carry that interest with them for the remainder of the semester. And I usually spend about a week, so I kept trying to think, what am I going to do this second week to make more of a connection with my students? So that second week I was struggling, what topic do I want to discuss? Do I want to give them an experience of something that happened to me in college? Do I want to give them some tidbit of something that's going on in my career? And I felt like all of that was still impersonal. And I ended up sharing with them um, a slideshow of pictures of my dog that I had to put down. And what that did was opened up the class to share stories of their pets, um, to share pictures of their pets. Dr. Emman encouraged me and kind of made me open a Twitter account, um, which I did this last semester. I'm not that big on social media, but the Twitter account has been kind of life-changing for my students. They ended up tweeting me pictures um, of their pets. Um, they ended up having more discussions about sharing and kind of just us coming together more as a community. So I do want to give you some examples. Um, the example I want to give you, I'm going to start off with the man behind the inspiration. That is Dr. Chris Emden um, and his hashtag hip hop ed. This is actually an example of what he does with his grad students um, before every class just to kind of get them in the mood. And what it is is this term called ciphering. And ciphering and hip hop is where a group of people get together and they all have an input or a piece in making kind of the music or um, whatever kind of beat is going on. So with ciphering, we would all kind of get in a circle and we'd all contribute to the beat or we'd all contribute to the song. So I'm gonna show you an example of Dr. Eminence. And then I did this with my classes as well and I wanna show you an example of that. Dr. Emnen, um, he says what graduate school should look and feel like before every class we get the energy right, everyone participates.
clip and let them know we were going to be doing that. They were like, eh, but they did it. So my first class that did it is a 7.30 critical thinking class. Oh, no, this isn't my 7.30 class. This is my 12 o'clock class. actually a redo um, so my social problems class they felt that they were gypped in their environment and they wanted to do it over so we took it to the research office and got the researchers and the Dean involved to change your mind. Um, I had a student who added my class through Twitter. They did not come to my class. They did not email me, call me, come to office hours. Um, so when a student uses Twitter to add your class, hey, professor, I was just wondering if I could have a permission number for your class. I was floored because I've never had a student try to add a class like that. So um, I'm really glad Dr. Emin suggested it. So I would just recommend trying different techniques to engage your students. Um, technology really works. Meeting them at their level, learning what they like. My students introduced me to so um, much new music, even music as being kind of older than them. I was like, you guys like this song? But I could still appreciate them sharing it with me as I shared my old school songs with them. Thank you. Next. Um, we're, we're actually ahead of the game. We're supposed to be about 20 minutes per presentation. Um, so you're going to get out early. Because I'm, I'm not going to fill the available time. Um, but before we get started, uh, we need you to get in groups of two to three. And we have two handouts that we need each group to have. And um, uh, Ludmilla Moreau, who is the other, oh, I'm, I'm Linda Sarzan, I teach chemistry here. I'm also the coordinator of the Science Success Center. And uh, Ludmilla Moreau is the outstanding IA for the center, and she's passing the handouts out. And if someone would be uh, so kind to grab some stacks so that this group and that group can get them. And uh, we're making this kinesthetic, so we're asking you, if you're not sitting in a two or threesome, to move.
Villa has Rose Blossom. Okay, so um, I picked, um, I'm not, I, I don't really do PowerPoint in my classes. Uh, I like to do a lot more interactive kind of things. So anyway, when I'm putting this presentation together, uh, I thought, you know, all four colleges are gonna be here. So I wanted to pick something that had all four colleges colors in here. So is that, does, do all four colleges' colors show up in that? Ha, huh, you know your colors. That's good. Um, okay, uh, we're here uh, from representing the Science Success Center, and the Science Success Center is uh, a student support group, sorry, a student support center for students who are taking science courses. What we find is that, uh, especially fall semester when we have first time freshmen and they're taking any science course, be it a GE or majors, allied health, whatever, uh, that oftentimes the students come in thinking that what they did in high school in terms of getting themselves ready for an exam will still work at the college level. And very soon they find out that that's not true. So what we work on uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis is trying to improve their study skills and strategies. And we have half-hour appointments, one-on-one, uh, -on -one for six to eight weeks, where we go through a number of study strategies uh, to help the student not only improve their, their, their performance in the class, but also to build their own self-confidence, too. So one of the strategies that we're going to actually have you work through today is something called exam analysis. And part of the exam analysis is uh, Bloom's taxonomy. And many of the students have no clue what Bloom's taxonomy is. But you do, yeah? Have you never done anything through Socrates? Because uh, Socrates, when you put your curriculum outline in there, there's that whole section in there about Bloom's taxonomy. And the idea is, as you, that handout shows you, is that there's various levels of knowing information from basic knowledge, like um, what's the symbol for hydrogen, those chemists who are here. There we go. All right. Uh, to more, much more complicated and complex thinking as you move up. And, and this particular handout has Bloom's taxonomy going down in preference, uh, so that very bottom one is the highest level. Um, so as you can look through that, you can notice that the thinking involved for each of those levels is slightly different, especially if you compare the very top one with the very bottom one. And oftentimes we get students who are studying for exams or whatever at that knowledge level or the second one down, yet their exam questions are farther along. So what we have the students do is take their exam uh, after they've taken it and try to figure out where on Bloom's taxonomy is the instructor asking them to respond to. So we're gonna make you do that with that piece of information about the company nurse. Now, have anyone ever heard of company nurse before? I'm gonna hide you. Oh, good, someone knows it, all right. Um, it's something out of the workman's comp thing, and uh, we're all supposed to be aware of it, and uh, I have no idea where we were supposed to get this knowledge. And so rather than having you 
go through this and read it, or worse, have someone go wah, 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 uh, which oftentimes happens at division meetings. Um, we're going to have you go through this by checking the questions on the back of that page. And you and your partner or partners are going to go through and see if you can figure out which level of blooms that particular question is at. And you're doing it as an instructor, okay? So you are fully qualified, I mean, fully experienced in making up it, your exams and et cetera, et cetera. So you've got some awareness of what level of, of knowledge you want your students to be at, um, uh, of what, you're, what level of knowledge you're assessing at. And so here's your opportunity to take a piece of context, a text that um, is non-disciplinary, which is why we picked this particular one, um, and see how well you can align those questions with the Bloom's taxonomy. How much time do you want? No, not one minute. How much time do you want? Five? Ten? Five? Go. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm timing you. Oh, and then mark on, your, mark on your paper which ones you think it is. Okay, I'm going to stop you at this stage. And uh, I, know, I know you haven't necessarily completed all 10 or 11 questions there, um, but are you having fun? Okay, so what I want you to do is have more fun by getting together with another group and comparing where you are at in term, you, know, you don't have to look at every single question, but you know, the top five, the first five, six questions, where are you and your other group? Are you at the same level? And explain why or why not. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop. I, I'm getting very cool conversations. I was hovering around, I didn't have a drone. I actually walked out and listened to all of you. Um, so, I'm going to throw this back out at you. Why do you think we have our students do this? Yeah. Did everyone hear him? Okay. Uh, oh, here, we got, we got the mic, don't we? Oh, no, we don't have that. Yes, yeah, stand, stand and deliver. Any, anyone else? Yeah. Stand, stand and deliver, please. Here, why don't you turn to them? <laughs> Any, anyone else want to share? Yeah, go ahead. Right, right, right. Uh, someone had a comment over here. Lock in on the level of abstraction that the, the, the instructor is working with, which is difficult to explain how the taxonomy is yeah. working with the instructor. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, we do it in the Science Success Center to get exactly what you're saying is uh, the students just don't, don't understand where they need to be at their level of comprehension. So this is a way to get them to reevaluate how they've been studying, what they've been doing, and hopefully improve their performance, not just in the science course that they're in, but in other courses also. Uh, I actually, when I write my exams, I have blooms out there, and I'm trying to write questions so that um, I'm hitting the different levels of blooms. And I have my students do this exact same thing, uh, my own students, not just Science Success Center students, um, because I want them to understand my thinking. 
I want them to see, I want to reveal, make it visible what my own thinking is as I make these exams. And so I've got these SLOs, I've got uh, 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 objectives for each of my units, and I want my students to be able to see why, how I combine objectives, uh, how I'm gonna ask the questions so that they become better thinkers, not just in my class, but in other classes also. Um, so we do this in the Science Success Center along with several other strategies and all that, and there's more to talk about than we have time for because I told you I only take 20 minutes and I'm already there. Um, and so what we have is uh, a flex opportunity for you. Hang on a second. Um, It's not there, because um, this is the older PowerPoint. Uh, the, we have a, it'll show up, start showing up on ARC's flex thing. Uh, we will, we are asking if people want to come and watch our session, sorry, our center in action. Uh, if you want an hour's worth of flex, give us a call uh, or email us. We've got email uh, also in the, the, what do you call it, on our website, you'll see it. And you can come in and make, make an appointment to come in and you can actually watch what we're doing. We'll have more than uh, opportunity to talk to you about what it is, share the, some of the strategies that we do with our students. And I know uh, Sac City has something like similar to this, Folsom Lake, and I'm pretty sure because Sumnus is on their way to doing it. So it's not just something that we at AR do, which is why I had all the colors earlier because it should be something across the district. Um, and just as a closing comment, uh, this morning, one of the speakers said something about the community colleges, like you can fail cheaper here. Remember that comment about, pro yeah, so, so I thought, no, 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 we need to flip that. Um, so I think California community colleges offer a private college education and experience at a public school cost. So go for it. Right. 